Hello, hello. Today we are discussing fine art versus commercial art. Specifically, should you be a fine artist or a commercial artist? Is it better to be a fine artist or is it better to be a commercial artist? Now, this is really a very personalized decision. And if you already have your art career well on track, then this might not be a topic that you wrestle with, or maybe you're particularly called to be a fine artist or a commercial artist, and you don't have any struggle deciding on your direction. But this is not the case for many of us. Many of us do wrestle with which direction to go in, when starting out in our art career or even people who are in the middle of their art career or later on. But I wanted to talk about this topic today because I know that I am not the only one that kind of wrestles with this question in one way or another. So we're gonna start off with talking about the pros or the advantages to the different kind of career paths. Now, these are the perceived pros. These aren't going to be something that is 100% true in either circumstance, of course, but these are the things that might be going through your mind and they're things that have definitely gone through my mind in kind of tackling the question of which direction I should go in. So let's start with the fine artist. Okay, now the first real, I would say, advantage or pro to being a fine artist is prestige. Now this is not 100% true, but there are definitely people out in the world that think of the fine artist as the quote unquote real artist. They're the per people you see with their art hanging in museums, they might win awards. And so some of us, when we picture our dream art career, we might think of, oh, I picture myself showing in that museum that I went to as a kid, or maybe winning some fancy art award. And often we are thinking of fine artists when we think of this prestigious, quote unquote, real artist. Now, as I said, I'm not trying to make actual value judgments here about whether that's correct or not, but I'm talking about our perceptions. A second pro of being a fine artist in terms of how we might perceive this career is freedom. So generally we think of a fine artist as someone who has the freedom to choose to kind of address any kind of topic, use any kind of style they want. They don't have to worry about if something's on trend or if it's going to sell. They might be doing something that's very unpopular at the moment and might be disturbing people and no one's going to want that up in their bedroom or in their living room, but they have the freedom to do it because that's what a fine artist does. They get to provoke, they get to delve deep into topics and they don't have to worry about whether it's going to sell or not. And related to this idea of freedom and delving deep into topics is intellectual satisfaction. So right, when we think of the life of a fine artist, we might think of someone that gets to, as I said, dive really deep into topics. I went to um, exhibition a couple of weeks ago at Rivalry Projects here in Buffalo, and there were people, there, were a, there was a group of artists that did some art with weather patterns and storms, right? So often fine artists can go really deep on different topics and do projects that might be reminiscent of an academic or a researcher. This is something that often we wouldn't see in the more commercial art sphere, but you know, you get to really nerd out as a fine artist and go as deep as you want on any topic that interests you. And you get to have interesting conversations with other artists that might be focused on the same topic or theme as you like gender or environmental policy, for example. The fourth advantage to the fine art career is romance, <laughs> okay? Society, we romanticize the fine artist. Now, often this is a picture of a 
20 something, 30 something year old man with a lot of naked female muses who drinks way too much, but somehow still has a really cool life and doesn't turn into an absolute alcoholic. Or maybe they do, but they're still really cool. Anyway, going a little overboard there. But yes, as a society, we often romanticize the fine artist as this really cool person that might be living in sort of an offbeat way. They're a little eccentric and they are a figure of myths and legends. So the fine artist path is a really romantic path, let's say. Okay, so those are just some of the advantages or perceived advantages of the fine art career path. Now let's talk about the commercial art career path. Now, when I talk about the commercial artist, I am talking about everything from a designer who might design logos or an illustrator to people who paint pet portraits. And this might even include people that do do landscape or human portraiture with a focus on making money, right? Commercial artists, commerce. So the focus of the art is as a money making product. You are creating a product or you're doing a service as an artist. This is your primary focus. So you're going down a more commercial artist path. Now, what are some of the advantages to this path or at least perceived advantages? Now, the first perceived advantage is money, right? We're talking about commerce, commercial artists. So the idea is you are doing art for the purpose of making money out of it, or you're focusing on how to make money as an artist, you're making things that sell, or you're providing a service that sells. So chances are, at least in our perception, a commercial artist is going to generally be a more, at least stable money-making venture, right? We all know, know that a fine artist might make a ton of money or they might make nothing and be broke, um, but their paintings sell for millions after they're dead, but they don't see a penny of it, right? So if you want to enjoy the fine life now, we often think that being a commercial artist might be the way to go. A second sort of advantage of the commercial artist path is that sometimes we think it might be easier. Now I'm putting this definitely in quotes because I will have to say many, many, many commercial artists have better technical skills than the average fine artist, right? I say this, especially someone that's illustrating, maybe they're drawing all day, every day because they're doing, you know, drawing cartoons or you're illustrating children's books, but you might be actually spending more time on your art skills. And in any case, a lot of commercial artists have just superb technical skills. But when I say easy, what I mean is kind of easier from the conceptual, intellectual standpoint, right? A commercial artist is free to just say, let's do a pet portrait. And you're just basically going to paint from a photograph, right? You're as a commercial artist, you're perfectly free and allowed to do that. There's no sort of judgment or you might say, okay, I'm going to paint some daisies today. Um, you know, do some abstract, like, okay, the color green and peach, you know, the, the color combination green and peach are really in. So I'm just going to do an abstract painting with green and peach. And I'm going to make it look really good and dynamic so that it will go well over rich people's couches. Now, you know, you do still have to have technical skills, as I said, and put some thought in this. But generally speaking, you don't really need to come up with some earth shattering concept for your art as a commercial artist. You know, painting someone's chihuahua is super and probably brings them a lot of joy, but you don't really need any deep concept to sell it. You can just say, hey, you know, would you like a painting of your chihuahua? If it's a good painting, people will like it. It's nice, people might buy it. And so in a lot of ways, it can actually be easier to be a commercial artist. You don't necessarily need to have a ton of edgy ideas. You don't have to have some grand idea that no one else came up with before. You don't have to worry as much about being unique. Okay, and the third and last advantage I would say to being a commercial artist is depending on what sort of your background is and who is around you, 
While being a fine artist might be considered more prestigious, a commercial artist might actually be more well-respected in certain groups, right? They maybe have a more normal profession, we can say. You know, they are a business person or a service provider. They either just very, you know, own their own design or illustration business or maybe work in-house for someone or they have a storefront. And this is something that a lot of other segments of society can relate to, right? Everything from hairdressers to bankers. So depending on who's around you, what kind of family upbringing you have, you might find yourself feeling more respected as a commercial artist. But this is of course not always the case. Some circles might respect a fine artist's life choices more. In any case though, I did want to bring that up because when you're making the decision of what kind of career path to follow, you have to think of where you're coming from and what are your values and you know what, what do you care about in terms of how you perceive yourself and how those around you perceive you. Now, for myself, when I was a kid, one of my very favorite artists was Andy Warhol. And that's probably because I really, really wanted to be a rock star, but I can barely carry a tune. And for me, Andy Warhol was the rock star artist. And him and a lot of pop artists did something revolutionary when they did something that was very in the middle. It was very in between fine art and commercial art. And, and for me, this sort of fine line has always interested me. But nevertheless, despite the fact that I have always told this line, even at my current stage in my art career, at my current stage in life, having been doing art for decades, but kind of earlier on in my art career, I guess you would call it, I still often find myself faced with this dilemma of which sort of path to focus on more, which path to go down, how do I perceive myself, how do I see myself, how do I want my future to look, and like many a Sunday, I was milling over life thoughts and I did what I often do and that was go to my form of church, which is an art museum or an art gallery. So it's definitely one of my favorite things to do on a Sunday. And this Sunday I visited the Birchfield Penny, which is a art gallery here in Buffalo, New York. And I walked in like I do most Sundays when I go to church with deep questions about life swirling around in my head and always hoping that the art that I see is going to give me inspiration either for my art or for my life. And the, the today's topic was one of those things swirling around in my head. Now the exhibition that I was most excited to see was an exhibition called Leroy in Living Color. And this was a retrospective of works from Leroy Johnson. I really enjoyed it, but while I was in there, I also stopped by a section of the gallery that has some of the permanent collection in it. And this being the Birchfield Penny, the permanent collection at this gallery contains a lot of works by Charles Birchfield. And he was an artist that lived from the late 1800s to 1967. And because this museum is partially named after him, they even have a replica of his studio. So that was really cool. I made sure to take a look. And then I was looking at his works and they include a lot of fine art. One of the biggest things he's famous for are landscapes done in sort of a moody style that is very reminiscent of the moodiness of the weather here in upstate New York. But, and my Spoonflower artists will really appreciate that. Spoonflower is a print-on-demand site that does um, fabric and wallpaper for those of you who don't know. Um, they actually had some hand-painted repeating patterns by the artist up there and it really caught my eye. I'd never, I'd been to the museum once before years ago, but it was before I was making repeating patterns, so I never noticed it. So they really caught my eye and I 
went up and I was looking at the hand-painted repeating patterns from the very early 1900s. And what was also interesting is that not only did they have the repeating patterns, but they had some text accompanying the artwork. Um, and some of them were just freestanding with notes by the artist to himself. And so this one, for example, reads, and I'm just going to read it. This one reads, no title. They asked for a modernistic pattern, and this is what I cooked up. It was very successful. Date, 1927. It was about this time they started putting my name on the salvage. Now, what I found so interesting about this, what really sort of sparked the gears of my brain going, was that obviously Mr. Birchfield was a very successful fine artist in the traditional sense, right? Here's a dude from the, doing art in the 1920s and he's up in museums with the type of paintings that we traditionally see in museums. So, right, he's fine artist. He's the successful kind of fine artist. And other parts of the exhibit, we're talking about a lot of his concepts, right? He delves deep into these concepts. He's not just painting landscapes with no sort of conceptual framework around them. No, he's a traditional fine artist, but clearly he was also a commercial artist. And obviously at one point he was a fine artist making some commercial artwork that might not have even been that successful, right? They weren't putting his name on the salvage yet. Um, but he does this one when they asked him to do a modernistic spin and suddenly, you know, he's having success as well as a commercial artist. So, you know, it's nearly a hundred years in the future and I know that old white man, they're problematic, but this dead old white man kind of, I felt like he was speaking to me across time in this gallery, right? I was having this question and he's saying to me, you can do both, Aurora, right? You can be a fine artist, maybe one that's not really even caring about money with certain kinds of art, but you're also free to just make some repeating pattern designs and maybe they'll be successful and maybe you'll also be really proud and excited about that, right? This guy wasn't, you know, he wasn't too cool to be like, dude, I made a bunch of sales, right? And this note he wrote to himself gets put up in the museum. So I hope if you are having this quandary of what path to go down, that some of what we talked about today helped give you some insight. Now that, that insight might be now you actually do want to go down one path more than another or completely focus on one path. But I do want to say to you, if there are others out there like me who might sometimes struggle with their identity as someone that does both kind of conceptual fine art that's not focused on sales and then more salesy things like maybe print on demand or other kinds of commercial arts, that it's completely okay to walk that fine fuzzy path. Okay. So again, I, I hope you found some value in this episode. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. In the words of Mr. Birchfield, draw, draw with paint. And until next time, keep creating.